You're listening to the Converging Paths podcast, brought to you by Asia House and the Barakat Trust, with the support of the Al Tajir Trust and the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Hello, everyone. This is Saif and Rashidi from the Barakat Trust, your host for today's episode of the Converging Paths podcast. And today we're very happy to have Dr. Glare Anderson from the Edinburgh College of Art. She's senior lecturer in Islamic art and in art history. And she's going to talk to us about a fascinating figure, Abbas ibn Farnas, an inventor who lived in the ninth century Cordoba in Spain. So welcome, Glare, and thank you so much for being on our podcast series. We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. So Glare, just to give us some context, can you tell us what the intellectual culture of ninth century Spain was like? And how was it similar or different to the rest of the Islamic world at the time? Yes. Well, ninth century Spain, I think, was quite a fascinating place. Usually when we think about early Islamic Spain, especially if we're thinking about art and architecture, we might be thinking about 10th century Cordoba, especially when some of the masterpieces of Islamic art that we know, like the wonderful mosaics from the Mosque of Cordoba. But in the ninth century, Cordoba was laying the groundwork to become what it what it then ascended to by the 10th century. In the 9th century, you might think about Islamic Spain and in particular the capital city of Cordoba as being about upward ascendancy, I guess, uh, in some ways. You know, the Umayyad dynasty who had transferred to Spain from Syria in the 8th century, that dynasty was enjoying a period of stability. They were building up uh, the city of Cordoba, their capital, expanding the great mosque of Cordoba, building a series of suburban villas that became centers of intellectual culture in that century. They were experimenting with things like agriculture, introducing new crops into Spain that hadn't been cultivated there previously. So things that are now very common to us, like bananas or rice or sugarcane, famously uh, pomegranates from Syria, if we're thinking about Cordoba, you know, laying the groundwork for what has been called a green medieval revolution or, or medieval green revolution that made them extremely wealthy. Uh, and with that wealth and stability, they were focusing, uh, actually looking around at what was going on in the rest of the Islamic lands, looking at other great centers of Islamic culture, cities like Damascus especially, but also their neighbor Kairawan in what is today Tunisia, and really participating in what, would, what was starting to become an international Islamic court culture. So not only in, you know, things like agriculture and, and politics and so forth, but things like uh, music. So if you know the, the famous musician Ziryab from, the, from Islamic civilization, the ninth century is when Ziryab came to Cordoba from the Abbasid court and introduced fashions in music and hairstyles and food and so forth into the court at Cordoba. So it was in the process of really becoming the city that by the 10th century, scholars uh, of the time most often compared it to the great global cities of the day, cities like Damascus, Baghdad, and Constantinople most often. Thank you. It sounds like a very inspiring place to have lived. Yes, I think it was a it was a very vibrant place to be in the ninth century, I think. Well, turning to this great inventor, Abbas ibn Farnas, who you spent many years studying, can you tell us a bit about him? What did he do as a young man? And how did one become an inventor in the ninth century? Yes. Um, well, I, I have to say there is, there is a little bit of mystery surrounding his background, right? We, we know about him from the Arabic, the medieval Arabic texts who talk about his career once he arrived in Cordoba and established himself in the court. But what I'd like to do is to, is to read to you what the greatest historian of medieval Spain, I think it's safe to say, Ibn Hayyan, and his sources, who were the other intellectuals of early Islamic Spain, how they described 
Ibn Firnas and his background, and then we can uh, maybe talk a little bit about that if you like. So this is what they tell us about Ibn Firnas and his background. They call him the wise man of Al-Andalus. And in the time of the Emir Al-Hakam, Abbas Ibn Firnas, the wise man of Al-Andalus appeared and he superseded all others in the number of skills and arts. His complete name is Abu Al-Qasim Abbas Ibn Farnas Ibn Wardas. He was a client of the Umayyads of Berber lineage, originally from the province of Takaruna, which I, I think is in Ronda uh, in present day Spain, uh, but having moved to Cordoba. So we get the sense, even from you know, just that uh, little bit of information, that this is someone who came from the provinces in a sense, right? But, but came to Cordoba and established himself in his career and then became known, and I'll, I'll continue with what the Arabic text says, he was learned, refined, an able philosopher, a brilliant poet, an inspired and a truthful astrologer. He was sensible and penetrating in his excellent thoughts, full of inventiveness and of the capacity for innovation. So that gives us a little bit of a sense of how early Islamic intellectuals, and in this case, the great historian of early Islamic Spain, Ibn Hayyan, how they remembered him in, in the early medieval period. Just to give you a little bit more of the flavor of this, one of the viziers, so, you know, these are these are quite learned and eminent uh, members of early Islamic court society and intellectual society who were writing about him and remembering him. So this vizier said that Abbas ibn Firnas devised during all of his life subtle inventions and marvelous innovations in more than one art, in jest and in seriousness. So we get a sense that he had a, a sense of humor. He also played the oud and composed beautiful melodies. At the same time, he dominated poetry and developed well in its paths, being a person of many merits and enormous advantage, splendid qualities, and well-known anecdotes. His life was prolonged until, until his death in the year 274 in the uh, Anno Hijri, having served with three rulers, between him and his grandfather Al-Hakam, to all of whom he dedicated select panegyrics and with all of them excellent anecdotes. Uh, so this also, you know, gets across a little bit of a, a portrait of this man that other intellectuals from early Islamic Spain found to be extremely learned and well-versed in many, many different fields of endeavor. In fact, he had two positions in the early Islamic court. One was as court poet, and there are places in the early Arabic texts that describe him as being the greatest poet out of all of the court poets in early Islamic Cordoba, but also astronomer, court astronomer. So, and he received two salaries for those positions. And they remembered him as someone who was a master of what they called the sciences of the ancients. So things that we think about from antiquity, like philosophy and the exact sciences and so forth, but also a master of poetry and, and the various things that might fall under the category of the Islamic sciences in the ninth century. Thank you. Can you tell us a bit about some of his inventions? Yes, absolutely. He's best known well, I should say he's not best known, but the other intellectuals of his time, this is what they remembered him for. They remembered him for making the designing and making the earliest instruments for the Islamic rulers of Cordoba. And one of the two instruments that he is supposed to have made is a water clock. And in fact, the Arabic reference uh, to the water clock that Ibn Firnas designed and made, according to, to them, without any plan or anything, he is supposed to have been so inventive that he was able to de design and build a water clock for the ruler, and also an armillary sphere, uh, which is a scientific instrument used in astronomical calculations of, of various kinds. So these two types of scientific 
precision instruments, the water clock, which would become one of the most important technologies of the entire medieval globe, and the armillary sphere speaking to his professional interests, in fact, in astronomy uh, and astrology. And he didn't only invent and construct these fine precision scientific instruments for the rulers, but according to these early Arabic texts, he also composed poetry. And remember, of course, that was his other job in the court, was court poet. He composed poetry, and the texts tell us that he inscribed the poetry on these instruments, um, and they, in fact, preserve it. So I can, I can read you a little bit of the poetry that he is supposed to have composed and, uh, and inscribed on the instruments, if you like. So on the clock, this is the poetry that he inscribed. He wrote, I am the best instrument for religion when you don't know the moment of each prayer, when one cannot see for oneself the sun in the day, nor the stars in nights of deep darkness. For the blessing of Muhammad, Imam of the Muslims, with me, the moments of prayer are clear. So this is quite wonderful poetry because it's, it's as written as if the clock is speaking to the viewer who is looking at it and telling the viewer about how useful it is as an instrument for being able to know the exact times for prayer, right? Even if you can't see the stars or if you can't see the sun, um, which would be normally the, the methods that one would use, right, to determine the times for prayer. The clock is saying, you don't need those things because you have me. So I'm the best instrument for prayer. Well, also, I think it's fascinating that to think of religion as pushing science forward. Sometimes yes. religious, religion is accused of, of stifling science, and I think it's a nice example of the opposite. Yes, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And, I, and that certainly makes the, this period, especially the ninth century in my mind, um, so fascinating because I think in our post-enlightenment sort of uh, framework, we tend to think of science and religion as being quite separate and not only separate, but as you say, e even opposed somehow. And we actually see just the opposite at this moment in the history of Islamic civilization. And I think it's, it's a, a very instructive lesson. You also mentioned the chamber that he constructed in his house. Can you tell us about that? Yes, he is supposed to have designed a chamber, which is often described as a planetarium. There's, there's been a little bit of confusion about what exactly this thing was, but I'll tell you what the Arabic intellectuals remembered it as, and then, and then we can talk about that if you like. So the Arabic text says, Abbas ibn Firnas manufactured a reproduction of the heavens in his house, which he assembled in scientific fashion, representing the stars and setting up mechanisms that appeared to its viewer as though they were stars, clouds, thunder, and lightning. He showed it often to the notables among the people, boasting of his wisdom and news and talk of it spread. And we can talk about this a bit more, but, but even in this very brief text, I mean, we want to know more about this chamber, but even this brief text gives us a sense that it was, a, it was an architectural space, but an architectural space that was designed to be a space of scientific visualization and also one that didn't just show celestial phenomena like, like stars and clouds, but that also made people imagine that they could hear and see thunder and lightning. And in fact, there is some poetry preserved by a rival poet of Ibn Firnas's at the time that also suggests there was some kinetic aspect to this chamber as well. It didn't just visualize these, you know, scientific celestial phenomena, but it also moved. So it was a, a moving device. It made noises and it also had these visual effects like showing clouds and lightning. So quite a fascinating chamber and a, a space of early science.
So an early immersive experience, one would say. Absolutely. I, I would definitely say that. Well, let's turn now to his most daring and perhaps celebrated experiment, that of the first flight. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. So his experiment in flight is the thing that he's best known for today. And he's, you know, as, as many of your listeners will know, he is a figure who is um, who's quite well known as a, as a scientist, especially in Muslim majority countries. He's remembered primarily as a scientist and primarily for making this experiment in flight. And so historians of science and technology have looked at his um, flight experiment as, um, as potentially the earliest successful experiment in early gliding flight. So that is something that is debated. But what I think is really quite fascinating is going back to what our earliest, most substantive account of this flight says about it. So I'll read that to you if you would like to hear what this account of this early aeronautics experiment says. So this comes from, again, another one of the very eminent uh, intellectuals. In this case, someone who went on to become the, the Qadi, the chief judge of the Great Mosque of Cordoba. He says, Abbas was so full of ingenuity creativity, originality, invention, and resourcefulness that he was attributed with the knowledge of magic and alchemy. And this is another thread that comes up and was often challenged on religious grounds. Some sheikhs said that he once managed to launch himself into flight. He clothed himself in feathers fastened to light colored silk, and he spread for himself two wings of calculated structure with which he was able to rise into the air. He flew from the vicinity of Rusafa. Rusafa was the great suburban villa that was a center of court life in early Islamic Cordoba at the time. So he flew from the vicinity of Rusafa, moved through the air, and then circled until he landed in a place far away from where he had departed. But this landing went poorly when he hurt his tailbone. He had not managed the landing very well. He did not take into account that a bird, when landing, does so on its tail head, which he neglected. He was more frightening in this flight than the clamor of the scattered places of Saharan nomads who ruminated at length over what they had witnessed without knowing what it was all about. <laughs> so, so this is, this is what, uh, this is a, a brief text, but it's actually much more detailed and substantive than the accounts that were circulated centuries later. And this account comes from someone who knew Abbas ibn Firnas personally. So although he wasn't himself an eyewitness to the flight, he was a contemporary of ibn Firnas's. And what he's relating in this account is, is what he had heard from his informants, who he says, some sheikhs. So some, some important people in Cordoba who witnessed this aeronautics experiment. And what do you think gave him the idea of trying to fly? I think there are two, probably two factors that may have inspired the idea for his flight. Um, I've already mentioned his, his job as court astronomer and court astrologer. And over the course of his long career, I mentioned that he held his position in court over the uh, reigns of three successive rulers in early Islamic Spain, which meant that he spent quite a lot of time observing the skies over Cordoba, and he probably spent quite a lot of time at Rusafa, this important villa of the rulers of Cordoba that is mentioned in this account, that, that this is where the flight experiment took place. And in Cordoba, the topography uh, of Cordoba, and in particular, the topography of the 
the part of Cordoba just outside the walled urban center, the topography and the gradual elevation of that part of the city where there is a mountain range, the same features of that topography, the elevated mountain range, that make it very pleasant for building something like a suburban villa where a ruler would want to go and relax and pursue leisure activities, you know, the the coolness, the elevation of the site. Those topographical features also contribute to, to supporting air currents that actually make this topography very conducive to gliding flight. And so in addition to the landscape itself and the way the topography of Ibn Firnas's environment would have supported the kind of wind currents that would make an experiment in gliding flight, I think, possible, the other thing that he might have seen in his environment and as he was observing the skies over these decades uh, that he was in his position at court are the vultures and eagles that glide in these air currents over the skies of Cordoba, and in particular, these old world vultures that are native to southern Spain and to North Africa, and which in fact actually play an important role in the history of aviation in, in the modern period. But I think that, you know, just naturally because of his Uh, scientific interests, his observation of natural phenomena, that he was very much a person of his time. And remember that in the ninth century in the Islamic lands, we're talking about the period of the early Islamic scientific revolution in which intellectuals in the court, for instance, in Abbasid Baghdad, this is when intellectuals in the Islamic world are observing natural phenomena, they're experimenting, they're um, looking back at uh, the sciences of the ancients and testing them and improving upon them. And I think that mindset of scientific observation of natural phenomena and a desire to experiment and the, uh, the sort of encouragement that that was given in the intellectual Uh, atmosphere of the ninth century world, I think this greatly contributed to um, inspiring the idea for for an aeronautics experiment, which otherwise seems quite anomalous and puzzling to us in in the 21st century. Also, it's wonderful that he did it when he was in his 60s, so it showed that he had a very adventurous spirit and youthful spirit. Yes, absolutely. And that's certainly something his personality, I would describe as uh, certainly he had a bigger than life personality. And it comes through very clearly uh, in these early Arabic texts and the way people who knew him and and people who lived soon after him and, and heard stories and anecdotes about him describe him. And yes, the fact that he carried out this purported experiment in flight In his, you know, at the end of his life, near the end of his life in his 60s, reminds me of of another aspect of Islamic intellectual culture at the time that may have inspired him. Because, you know, when I first started to think about, you know, why why might, how, how would a ninth century person like Ibn Firnas have come up with the idea for flight? I mean, of course, we can think about the way in Islam, you know, you can think about Muhammad's night journey and Burak, you know, and, and the, the way flight and angels and, and angels' wings are described, for instance, in the Quran. You know, there's, it's part of the imagination in the culture already. And of course, it's also part of that heritage of antiquity, which Islamic intellectuals at the time were thinking about. Uh, and specifically, I'm, I'm thinking about the translation movement again in Abbasid Baghdad, where they're thinking about all of those texts from antiquity, both Greek antiquity, but also uh, Persian and Indian antiquity, and translating those texts. So, you know, I wondered if something like the ancient Greek myth of Icarus and Daedalus, the, the famous Greek Uh, inventor and craftsman and architect who is supposed to have designed the wings 
for himself and his son Icarus to fly, if you remember that that ancient Greek myth. If the, you know, if this might have been part of his, um, you know, part of uh, what inspired the idea as well. Um, but one figure that I uh, that I think may have been in his mind precisely because of his advanced age is a very important figure in uh, Islamic intellectual culture in the ninth century. He was becoming very important. And that is this figure, Luqman, Luqman the Wise, who was a pre-Islamic uh, character. Some people gave him uh, the, the status of prophet, but he was a wise man. Uh, there is a chapter, of course, a surah of the Quran that is named after him, the 31st chapter of the Quran. Um, and Luqman was associated with several things that Ibn Firnas was likewise associated with. One was his um, old age, and one, um, and the other was for being very wise. So he was associated with age, similar in a way maybe to the figure of Methuselah. You know, for some of your listeners who think about, you know, someone who's supposed to have lived to a very great age, to have been very wise. Uh, and he was associated with vultures uh, as well. And so these, you know, the, I think the possibility that Ibn Firnas was observing these vultures, which in Islamic civilization, quite differently, I would say, from, from European Christian civilization, which tends to have a negative view of vultures. In Islamic civilization, vultures were uh, admired, very much adv admired and revered um, and known as lords of the air precisely because of their peerless mastery of gliding flight. And this figure of Luqman, this ancient, wise, um, Islamic sage, um, Luqman was particularly associated with vultures as well. So I think there was a whole web of associations, cultural associations within ninth century Islamic um, society and intellectual and, and religious culture that could have inspired the idea for this flight, especially given um, environment and the intellectual culture of early Islamic Spain in which Ibn Firnas was working and in fact creating. Thanks. Well, how were his experiments received overall? Oh, the, the reception of his experiments was, um, I would say overall, it was quite positive. Uh, and, and maybe you can get a sense of that from those, you know, um, from the accounts in these Arabic texts, this kind of character sketch that, uh, that you know, other intellectuals in the court, uh, who included very eminent religious figures um, as well, uh, they looked at what he did with clearly a lot of admiration. They, they spoke of him as, you know, um, as someone who was unmatched for his inventiveness, his curiosity, all of his various uh, talents. But it was not universal admiration. And as some of these texts note, he was challenged on religious grounds. You know, we mentioned the chamber that he designed in his house and, and which became such such the talk of other intellectuals who apparently wanted to see it for themselves. But one of his rival poets in the court, for instance, wrote a very scathing poem about that chamber and about Ibn Firnas, in which he basically mocked Ibn Firnas and not only mocked him, but also called his chamber the, the reflection and suggestion of Satan. So this, I think, gets across another strand of, of Ibn Firnas's reception, not so, much, not so much within the intellectual circles of Cordoba, but, but with people outside the intellectual circles. And so, for instance, one of the things that the Arabic texts tell us about is the dangerous consequences that some of his more heterodox uh, experiments and, uh, and aspects of reputation. So remember, he was, they remembered him as, as someone who was a master of, of magic and alchemy and other sort of aspects of occult knowledge and not always in a positive way. So one of the things that's preserved is 
that the townspeople of Cordoba at a certain point uh, actually accused Ibn Firnas of irreligiosity, of heterodoxy, of uh, zandaka uh, in the Arabic, and he, he was put on trial for sorcery because some of the townspeople of Cordoba witnessed something uh, that in the text sounds very gruesome. They say that some of them said that they saw blood welling from the drain pipes of Ibn Firnas's house in January. <laughs> a very, I mean, a very weird and, uh, and gruesome image for sure. But, you know, you might also think about if, if this is someone who's uh, reputed to be practicing alchemy and so forth, you might think about, well, perhaps he was doing some sort of chemistry, what today we would call chemistry experiments uh, that produced these kinds of odd, for the time, perplexing phenomena. And other people said, other townspeople said that they heard him saying things that were, that sounded like magic, you know, magical spells. So he was accused of sorcery and was brought to trial for it. And the interesting thing about, about that aspect of his reception is that the Arabic texts tell us that those who brought him to trial and accused Ibn Firnas of being a sorcerer, that the, the intellectuals of the time, and in fact, the Qadi of Cordoba, the chief judge of uh, Cordoba, in vain tried to convince these people that Ibn Firnas was in fact innocent. The, the Arabic text says that the Qadi uh, discussed the matter with them in order to enlighten them, but in vain. Uh, he was trying to tell them that they, didn't, they simply didn't understand the things that Ibn Firnas was doing, but there was nothing that he was doing that, that was punishable. So the text gives us an interesting glimpse of what non-elite people thought about the activities of the sort of, you know, larger than life court intellectual who was doing some things that were different, obviously different than what his peers were doing, and not everyone approved of those activities. So it's good that the court felt that there was a value and a merit to science and scientific inquiry and research and invention. Yes, and that was something that, that surprised me, actually, when I went back to the, the early Arabic texts to find out, you know, who is, who is talking about Ibn Firnas and who is remembering him? And it was quite a surprise to me to find out that the people who were remembering him were, you know, were chief judges, qadis, they were viziers, they were eminent learned men who were members of Cordoba's intellectual elite and who very, very much for the most part, I think, seemed to admire and approve of the scientific experiments that he was doing and the, the whole range of activities that he was doing. Thanks. It sounds wonderful. And I should tell our listeners that we've tried to interview Glare for a year and a half, but she's been so busy working on a book about Ibn Fernas. <laughs> now it's gone to print or to press. So she's, she had the time to talk with us. So we look forward to your upcoming book. But I also thought I should ask you as a final question about your own work to create a digital lab for Islamic art, which seems to be very much in the spirit of Ibn Firnas and what we were talking about. So what are you doing in just a couple of words at the University of Edinburgh? Oh, thank you so much for asking about that. Yes, I founded this year a digital lab for Islamic visual culture and collections. And in the spirit of Ibn Firnas in many ways, as you point out, what I'd like to do with the lab is really to experiment with new ways of creating immersive experiences of Islamic architecture and art. So much like his chamber, that moving immersive experience of science in the ninth century, I'd like to experiment with, with mixed reality, with virtual reality and augmented reality and other digital visualization technologies to, to, to just create new and, and I think, uh, more compelling experiences of Islamic architecture and art for people to enjoy today. It sounds wonderful. Well, to close, Glare, I wondered if there are any lines of Ibn Firnas's poetry that you'd like to share just as inspiration. <laughs> 
Yes, there is actually one. I don't know if it's inspiration, but it is very funny uh, to me anyway. And this is the poetry, uh, some of the poetry that he inscribed on one of those scientific instruments. And I think in these lines, you'll see some of his brash personality <laughs> coming through. So this is an instrument that he made for the ruler and he inscribed these lines of poetry on it and sent it to the ruler. And it says, complete is the instrument that was commissioned of me that great philosophers could not achieve, save for me. If Ptolemy had been successful in doing so, I wouldn't be occupying myself with, and he goes on to talk about the astronomical tasks that he is obviously having to work through in his role as court astronomer. But, but there he is complaining about Ptolemy, the greatest figure in astronomy of the entire late ancient and medieval world, and complaining that if Ptolemy had done his job right, he wouldn't have had to put so much work into his tasks in uh, early Islamic Spain. So maybe his comeuppance was that he had a crash landing when he tried to blind. <laughs> <laughs> he might have he might have pushed the envelope too far with his uh, experiment in, in flight. Well, thank you so much, Glare. It was wonderful and so fascinating. And we look forward to discovering more about Ibn Farnas and about your lab, of course. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to, to finally get to uh, speak with you.